good afternoon to all of you. It's a pleasure to me to be here. And can I ask that my first slide be brought up on the screen, please? Very good. And I will simply signal when I want to move. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, <clears throat> something's gone wrong with the financial system. A global financial crisis in 2008 not just took, caused a huge economic downturn, but caused people to lose trust in the financial industry now so large. Perhaps the best way of putting the case is to imagine, ask you all to imagine that you're very ill. That, in fact, imagine that you're in an ambulance on the way to a hospital to have a liver transplant. And suddenly, halfway there, you get extra worried. You say to myself, you say to yourself, oh dear, uh, it's possible the doctors might whip out one of my kidneys and sell it in Singapore. And then you say, no, of course they won't do that. They're doctors. Doctors don't do things like that. And you relax. But as you do, you smile a bit and you say, but Goldman Sachs does. And this contrast between the sense of obligations in a profession like medicine and what has now become the bad behavior of those working in finance is the central part of what I want to talk about. Another way of putting this point was made to me by one of our colleagues working with us on this program who joined a large American bank in the 1980s and he said, I joined an institution whose purpose was to help its clients do well and to make fees from being helpful in that way. And 15 years later, I resigned in anger from an institution whose purpose was looking for people from whom it could make money. And that contrast between being of service and simply looking around for ways of ripping off people has become a central difficulty in the financial system. And what went wrong in the system had a huge amount to do with this selfish pursuit of uh, self-interest by those working in the firms, but it also had to do with the governance of those firms, which uh, played very little attention to the needs of the community which the firms were serving. I'm going to talk uh, briefly now about at the centre of this story is a contrast between two different ideas of how people behave and then I'm going to go on and look at the nature of the financial system uh, to describe and I've thought about doing the second point uh, in this con Islamic conference because I thought it would be helpful partly to engage with the panel which is coming next about the history of thinking to go on and talk about why ethical reform is necessary and to connect that with a religious understanding of moral obligation again something uh, that I was uh, pleased to think about for this conference before talking at the end about uh, something of a list of things to do Next slide, please. Uh, there are uh, two very different theories of human behavior that can be brought to bear to think about this problem. Uh, it's, uh, 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 the first is the one that comes from what you might call Econ 101, what we teach our students in economics, a view of human mo motivation that comes from Adam Smith's wonderful book, The Wealth of Nations. That is a view which says that it's not from benevolence that good outcomes happen, but because of people's regard to their self-interest, not uh, as a result of what they wish to do for others, but to the regard of their own self-love. And economists have taken this idea and worked very hard at pinning it down. 
And essentially they've uh, thought about individuals who are self-interested doing this in competitive markets and leading to good outcomes, the very famous phrase again from Adam Smith's invisible hand, each led in such a way acting with regard to self-interest to give, bring about good outcomes. And that's the economist's mantra. And of course then regulation becomes a search for market failures where the markets are not delivering the invisible hand and a setting about having, and we all are watching the explosion of regulatory activity in finance with the objective of doing what's described on this slide. However, that, thank you, that's fine. Uh, uh, however, uh, it, it, uh, it's my view that a uh, action of a regulatory kind is not going to be enough. And it's pretty obvious. These institutions are full of clever, well-resourced people whose job it is to make money. With that previous view of human nature, introduce a new regulation on Tuesday morning, and by Tuesday afternoon, someone will have figured out a way to arbitrage around it. It's not going to succeed. Succeeding has to rely on something else. And quite wonderfully, that something else also comes from Adam Smith. And that quote is, believe it or not, the very first sentence of his other book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, a view of human nature in which the interests of others and their happiness are necessary to an individual for his or her own happiness. Many professions understand this. The doctors that I talked about at the beginning of the talk would not whip out your kidney because that's just not what a, a professional like a doctor does. Uh, and it's my view and the view of many others that what needs to happen in finance is a move towards professionalism that relies on this sense of obligation to others in a way that's just not been shown. And I'm going to talk to you a bit about that. Uh, um, next slide, please. Let's go right back to the beginning and just understand what finance is. I imagine that there are many of you in the audience who are not economists, and it's always an a, a, a pleasure to talk to people who are not trying to figure out where to start. And, and, and perhaps medieval Europe is the best place to start. Just imagine that world, uh, and I was going to say going nowhere, and that's the right way to think of, about such a world, very static, very class-based, with a sovereign, nobility, and peasantry. And there's essentially nothing in that world that requires a financial system, except possibly the financing of wars by the sovereign. And the financiers in such medieval Europe, European systems were not central. Indeed, uh, they were outsiders. As we know, uh, in Europe, many of them were Jewish outsiders, and there were great cultural issues about their relation to the society that they lived in. But our society, a progressive, that's to say growing, changing, property-owning democracy, is utterly different from that. Think about finance centrally as about what gets saved and what those savings are used for. And I've described very simply uh, a set of things that we all understand there need to be savings for, home ownership, pensions, health care, unless you live with a national health service, many people need to save for health, and certainly education of children. And what are the savings used? But, uh, who uses them? Industrial firms, families who have mortgages for their homes, increasingly people who need student loans for their children, people, children, the families, and entrepreneurship. And those wanting to invest 
normally don't come from wealthy families and have the opportunity. And this, the, the best way of making this point is to talk about my second son, who's a chef, and, and about one of my friends in another city in Britain, I won't name him or where, who's very wealthy, and he has a nephew who's also a very good chef. And this wealthy friend's nephew was set up with multiple million pounds in the centre of London and now runs a wonderful restaurant, very well regarded. Well, I think my son's just as good a chef, I would say that, wouldn't I? But neither I nor any of my relatives have the money to set my son up as a capitalist uh, 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 runner of a restaurant, if he wants to get there, he's going to need finance. And everything on this slide shows you just how central the financial system is, all the way down to those individual stories. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, let's just think about, uh, you'll see at the bottom of the slide, I'm getting to the very important, uh, no, next slide. Uh, you, um, sorry, I, I, I'm talking to myself. Please go back, if you would. The, we're going to be thinking about the theory of interest. That's going to be about rebirth in the next discussion. So having described to you what a financial system is and why we need it, let's just think about, in that world, how we think about interest. Well, it, when I started to say this, of course, you have to go right back to the beginning and ask, interest is a price of savings, and so after what, what are prices? And my subject has a wonderful history of thinking about prices and what they are. Uh, 250 years ago, the word was value rather than price. And way back in physiocratic France, not long out of the medieval Europe I was describing to you, people thought that value came from the land. They would do that, wouldn't they? That's how that world worked. Agriculture was at the center. And the physiocrats had what we now think of as rather strange land theory of value. But as the classical economists, Smith, Ricardo, and essentially Marx, uh, came to understand the 19th century, it's no surprise that they thought the labor theory of value was what, was what needed to think about price. And Marx uh, carried that set of thoughts a very extraordinary way in constructing a theory of exploitation in that whatever th the price that things sold for, in whatever way it was more than the labor embodied, that was exploitation. And that idea will also be important in thinking about Reba later on. Um, and uh, when I was a student, we spent a lot of time thinking about the labor theory of value. Uh, uh, lots of people on the left were very taken with it. But in the last hundred years, economists have come to think that it's neither land nor labor that is really what value is about. Oh, brilliant, thank you very much. Uh, but but um, scarcity. And uh, uh, price depends on what you might say is marginal valuation. And I have a kind of economist joke at the bottom of the slide. Uh, it took economists about 200 years to understand the calculus. Newton invented it to do, geo uh, to, to do uh, gravity and the solar system. Economists finally realized that what really matters for price is the marginal valuation of something and its marginal cost of production. That's to say, the price of bananas in a market in the end settles at the point at which it's just worth me making that last banana. And someone's going to buy it at a price where it's just worth them buying it. And all those other bananas right back that before the last one are very valuable. They're more valuable than the last one. You know, imagine you stuffing yourself full of bananas. The, the, the last one isn't very valuable, but you bought it. That's the price. And then the last one, you know, the person making it, last one's pretty difficult to get off the tree up there. It's quite hard. All lots of ones, easier. But at 
the margin is what you think about as value. For a modern economist, that's what value is. Well, uh, a modern theory of interest is exactly like that. And I think it's helpful to say this because much uh, Christian thinking about uh, the nature of usury and interest was carried out many hundreds of years ago before economists had understood why it wasn't land or labor, but why it was scarcity that really determines price. And I think much discussion of Reba, that is a, <laughs> a trial run for what I'll say in the, in the, in, in the panel, uh, needs to engage with modern theories of price in an important way. And in this view, Interest is a reward for patience. I decide not to go on a holiday but to save for my pension, and, and, and I get a reward for doing that. And it's a return for productivity. The person who uses my savings sets up this restaurant in London and does very well and gets a reward. And that's a theory of price. That's a part of the story. But you then have to ask savings and investment, how are they brought together? It's risky, well, because this restaurant in London might go bust. The, it turns out, and now I'm giving away secrets, it also had an ice cream shop, and the ice cream shop got cockroaches in it, and it shut down, made a loss of a lot of money. It's risky to invest. You have to ask, how is this risk born? Well, Banks, which are very modern institutions, in the medieval world I began with, they weren't banks. They began in, in Renaissance Italy, basically. Uh, banks are institutions where I put my money and get a, an interest, and you borrow from the bank at a particular rate of interest, but if you borrow to set up that restaurant and it's filled up with cockroaches and you go bust, the bank bears that risk, and I, as a depositor in the bank, don't, and indeed with the depositor guarantee, we all expect that our banks won't go bust. But we could hold our money as savers in equity. It's quite hard to figure out how the equity market works and do it, uh, and I've never been very good at it, and I'm, I'm an, an economist. It's, it's difficult. What you do then is you buy stocks and shares, and they go up and down in value, and you bear some of the risk, but you get a reward for that. And an essential part of thinking about finance is not just this idea of interest at the top of the slide, but also of who bears the risk and how that influences the reward that savers get for saving their money. Uh, and so there's a bank or there's an uh, equity market. And in the middle, there's slightly crazy things called investment banks, which basically do deals. And I have friends who've worked in them, they, they just do deals. They go around looking for people who want to borrow money, and they go around looking for clever people who have got enough money to figure out how to do a deal, and they put deals together. And they're risky as can be, and they make heaps of money doing these deals. Uh, and, and if you're lucky, you can find a good investment banker who'll share some of the, uh, the rewards for doing this very risky deal. Uh, but you can also find some investment bank bankers that basically just make a mess. There's a story that's really important in finance about how investment bankers have infected the regular retail banking down there and ordinary commercial banking there. I told you that a retail bank is where I put my money safely and where uh, the banker lends to people to set up a restaurant and it understands credit and, and that's what we thought it used to be. But these hooligans from investment banks in the last 25 years have invaded retail banks and turned them into casinos which have taken my deposits and done this, that, and the other thing with them in order to make heaps of money and in the end go crash and have us all pay for their failings because we rescued the banks. 
So there have been many, many, many things. Can I, I probably can't go backwards. Could you go backwards one slide, please, up there? Thank you. Not just uh, banks becoming casinos, but there's been sale of inappropriate products. In Britain, uh, uh, banks sold uh, protection for getting unemployed, and it turned out all the insurance contracts that they sold had strikeout clauses, which meant that you could never claim. And I bought a mortgage with an insurance about if I lost my job, uh, I'd be able to pay the mortgage even though I didn't have any income, and no one could ever claim in these. And there's been in my country 20 billion pounds of reward, of recompense. It's huge amounts of money for straight, and I was going to say fraud. The defense is that this was kind of mistaken marketing but you can form your own judgment about how you want to describe it. Um, there are two uh, particularly interesting stories about bad behavior that it's worth telling. And just to imagine you're a, a, a fund manager and you're quite good at understanding derivatives. I'll tell you what you should do, and this is a story described by one of my colleagues in a lovely paper in the book that I've just edited. Uh, you should get a derivative on the weather, and it works like this. You can work out that on this bet, nine, 19 times out of 20, the following thing won't happen, and one time in 20 it will. About how, ma how many days in the year the temperature is below that? And then you find someone to get the other side of this contract, and you say, please pay me five pounds, f five pounds every, it's a hundred pounds. Here we are, this is a contract. And for the 19 times, you're going to pay me five pounds. And for the 20th time, you're going to get everything. And that's a contract easily available in the derivative market. So I put up David Vine's alpha best investment manager and I ask you in the front row to give me a hundred pounds and I'll buy one of these. And for the first year, I've given you 5% more than the normal returns on money. And next year, and next year, I say, wonderful. And on some time like year 13, when the mistake happens, you lose everything. And you know what I say? Stuff happens. And I shut the door, take the sign off, close down, and what do I do? I lose my bonus. Uh, and nothing else. Guess what? Next week I open up a new uh, office with David, a uh, new name, and, and uh, I start again. That's called being a, a well intelligent investment manager. Another way of being an intelligent investment manager is to uh, do something. Uh, something a bit like the following, and, and, and we're going to turn it into a Japanese nuclear power plant, but you'll see the point. I've got a choice. Do I look at Facebook or do I watch the dials? Supposing that I'm really selfish and, and I've got no you know, I'm not an engineer who cares about doing things well, you've got to bribe me into not playing with Facebook. Now, this pl power plant is so infrequently going to go bust that I do the calculation and I say, Facebook. How can you bribe me to pay, to, not to watch Facebook, but to look after this stuff? The answer is you have to basically give the five, op, do the arithmetic, the five people who are at the control dials have to own the whole nuclear power plant. It's just not possible to incentivize people to take due care when the risks are very, guess what, I'm, if any of you heard the technical term, I'm doing tail risks in this example. And as my colleague said, in the army, when you're on sentry duty and you watch Facebook, you do Facebook, you just get shot. These guys in these in investment firms, there is almost no penalty except losing that year's reward. So that's bad behavior. And uh, it leads me back to Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments 
and onwards to thinking about what to do with trust in finance. Just imagine how much tougher this is than the example I've already given you of the fund manager and the nuclear power plant. Because we're talking about pensions which last 25 years. And you have to trust me as somebody, not just to not rip you off this year or next year, but not rip you off all the way through those 25 years. And economists have lots of fun with in graduate school talking about trustworthiness, and they do repeated games, prisoners' dilemmas, and they study under what circumstances will it be in your self-interest not to renege on a promise? The answer is reputation. If you renege on a promise, then, then, then things will get... You know what the way to think about that is? At some stage in the life of a financier, it's worth closing down and just going to live in Bermuda uh, and, and taking all of what you've done and not worrying anymore. That's to say, if that's going to happen in next week, wouldn't you rip off everybody? And if you think it's going to, now I'm doing what technical people call backwards induction. If I know that this person's going to rip me off next week, then I'm going to worry about the fact that before next week he might think it's valuable to rip me off this week or that week. And you can, if there's ever a risk of this going wrong, simply relying on self-interested calculation to support trust unravels. It also unravels because it turns out that whatever you trusted turns out not exactly to happen. Because 17 years into it, uh, the temperature's different and different government and th all sorts. And then things go wrong. What do you do? A cooperative solution? No, you end up in court. So just relying on self-interested individuals to give rise to a trustworthy outcome isn't credible. In the end, to make valuable, trustworthy finance, you need to go back to the doctor story. You need to go back to Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments. You need to have some other regarding motivations in all of those uh, who are working in the industry. The final thing on the slide has the word framing. And framing is important. It, how do we think about a problem? Do we think about selling ice creams as leading, as needing a lot of other regarding obligations? No. We think about it like Adam Smith's invisible hand. Self-interest, sale of baked beans, markets, self-interest, fine. Do we think about doctors that way? Of course not. We think about them as being about other regarding obligations. Framing is about making it clear that finance is an activity that should be thought about like doctors rather than being thought about like uh, selling baked beans. And this matters. The very famous case in the last few years uh, where Goldman Sachs put together a package of dodgy debt in order to make money when it fell in price, and then another part of the institution sold this stuff to government agencies looking after the wealth of their communities. Very famous case. Uh, Goldman went to court and said, not our responsibility. Is that, you know, when you go to a wheat market, it's not the job of the people, person selling you the wheat to tell you any good, you have to caveat emptor, you have to look at the wheat and see if it's any good. Let's get real, we're not, we're not thinking about other people, we're just providing stuff. The framing argument says that you can't run a hospital that way and that you should not run a financial system that way, that people in the system should have a sense of obligation to those they serve that goes beyond the looking, my earlier story, looking for people from whom to take money. Um, the final point about m morals and ethics that I want to make before moving on to practical solutions 
is the following intriguing one. Some of the practical solutions will involve uh, fixing pay and incentivizing people not to behave badly. Some of the solutions will involve what I've been describing, uh, namely having people regard themselves as having an obligation not to behave badly. It's quite difficult in this world to walk on two legs at the same time. And let me tell you a story, true story, which shows why this is. A marvellous book by Michael Sandel, uh, just called What Markets Can't or Shouldn't Buy, which contains this true story. I'd heard it before. It goes like this. After school baby cl babysitting club, school finishes at three o'clock, parents are working, leave your children till five, pick them up at five o'clock, please. Parent, lots of parents being late. Uh, please don't come late. It's an, uh, I, want to go, I want to go home. I don't want to do that. Please. Parents keep on coming late. So in the end, the, the owners of this childcare centre said, well, we're going to put a charge. If you come late, you've got to pay some money. Guess what happened? More people started coming late. Why? Because they said to themselves, it's no longer a moral obligation to come on time. There's a price on this. And that shows just how hard it is to put a price on something to try and fix it, but at the same time say to people, it's your duty to behave in this way. But that's the challenge that reforming finance faces. Let's just rather quickly list the kinds of reforms that are necessary to fix this financial system. First of all, uh, a, a slightly different order from there. I, reason why, because on my very first slide I said there are two things to do. First of all, we want to... Uh, can I go... Could you go back one, please? Uh, uh, work on governance at the higher level is important and work on what happens to individual behaviour at the lower level is important. I'm going to start with the governance at the higher level, and then I'm going to go down to talking about individuals. At the governance level, the maximisation of shareholder value in corporate forms, firms in general and in financial firms in particular is an enemy of the good. This is now the famous and everywhere believed in theory of what corporate governance ought to do. Shareholders put up the money, governance, protect the shareholders. And it's very clear to see why the two famous economists from Harvard put this idea out. Just imagine a firm, uh, Mickey Mouse firm, simple idea, buys all its inputs competitively, including the labor on every day and in a competitive market, and it sells at the other end straightforward stuff like baked beans. But world is risky, there are earthquakes, there are the rain, you know, the drains don't work, things good or bad. Uh, but nobody else, those people out there who are selling their labor and those people buying the baked beans, they don't bear any of these risks. The shareholders bear the risks. It's obvious. They ought to be rewarded for bearing the risks. That's the theory of corporate governance that's everywhere dominant. Well, just ask yourself, the people who work this, for this firm have invested their whole life's career for the, in the firm. And the people who buy the aeroplane engines from this firm need to know that these engines will be properly serviced for 10 years. Both the suppliers and the customers bear risks. That means that th what the company does is important for them and the governance of the firm ought to care about that. It's a fantastically good example recently in Britain when Pfizer, the American firm, bid for AstraZeneca. And it turned out that Pfizer wanted AstraZeneca so that it could move its tax address from the US to Britain. Uh, AstraZeneca 
huge amount of research, just building a mega large research lab in Cambridge University, important for the British pharmaceutical industry. And Pfizer said, uh, of course we'll defend uh, th this research. And here's a piece of pa paper that says it. And the chief executive was interviewed by parliamentarians and it became completely obvious that this piece of paper was worth nothing. And uh, people remembered a takeover of a British firm three years ago, Cadbury's Drinks were, and Confectionery, when I think it's Mars or was it Kraft, took over this firm, promised stuff and reneged on every promise. So my colleagues thought it rather interesting. And, and, and what happened to the Pfizer AstraZeneca story, in the end there was such a public outrage that the corporate governance of that the, the board of AstraZeneca refused the takeover bid, and the shareholders were completely furious. There was big talk in Britain that they were about to launch a class action, would have, which would have put all of the board in jail for violating their responsibilities as directors. But they did, and the takeover wasn't allowed to go ahead. My colleagues thought it would be interesting to find out a little more and went to interview some of the key fund managers who tried to prevent, get this takeover to happen, tried to override the board. Uh, and he said, you know, what were you doing? And they said, there was a bid premium. This firm, when it was being bid for, was worth 30% more than without the bid. And we wanted the bid premium. And Colin said, and what about the research labs in in Cambridge, and they said, what? Get real. And that gives you a sense of why corporate governance needs to change. It's a wonderfully clear example. Going down to the more particular story, at the low, uh, uh, and, and I won't say much about this slide, uh, part of the change in corporate governance is going to, for lawyers amongst you, involve a reinstatement of some senses of fiduciary duty that fund managers used to have as an obligation. And in the 47 pages of fine print that you're meant to read at the front of a contract, you will normally find that this has all been signed away and it's been replaced by a contractual duty which is much less binding on the person who's looking after your money. But at the level of individuals, there's of course much to do about incentives and you've all uh, understood that what's been wrong in finance is that th essentially that investment bank deal making has come to permeate everywhere. People get bonuses f for, for, f f f f f for doing risky things or for doing things which are frankly disagreeable. A chief executive of a very successful Australian bank said to me roughly the following, I find it very difficult running a multi-purpose bank because down on the third floor are the people who do retail banking and commercial banking, straightforward stuff, straight fo not paid very much because they do straightforward things, well paid. Up there are the hooligans who do deals and they get heaps of money. And you know, they all have lunch together on the seventh floor. And after lunch, the people from the third floor come to see me and they say, can't we sell some fraudulent stuff, please? Don't care what it's like. I just want a bonus to get on with stuff. There's an infection uh, about I incentives in, 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 in integrated banking, which is a real worry. Uh, and that takes me to my last and most important point, which is about culture. That what needs to change is a sense of what it is, back to my central story, you need people in the end to be able to say to themselves when they think, uh, will I whip out that kidney and sell it in Singapore? They say, no, I just don't do things like that. And that needs to be part of the behaviour of bankers in understanding what their obligation is. This is profitable, rewarding, but I don't do that stuff. And 
and and this takes us into believing that not just ref the kind of ring fencing that's been discussed in Britain of separating the risks of one kind of banking from another, but straightforward separation for cultural reasons is important. And what sort of cultural behaviour uh, might you be able to induce? Well, there's been quite a lot of work about ethics management. And ethics management is mainly dodgy. What you do on, uh, uh, when you're studying for an MBA is you go to ethics classes and you learn how to tick boxes about which stuff you did. Uh, but do you really learn to do the sort of things that I've described? Not nearly often enough. And some of the crucial work that needs to be done is the kind of training in putting management and uh, um, all levels of, of financial institutions into positions where they understand the ethical choices that they need to make and are shown quite extensively what kind of things are acceptable not just for their interest but for the social interest and what things are not and what things are therefore ruled out. Uh, <coughs> And really my last thing is to say, supposing we've reformed corporate governance and we've got in place a system of the best ethics management in financial institutions that we can find, how could we describe what we're doing? It seems to the group of us working on this problem that there are four necessary steps. In any, and you'll, I'll show you a picture in a minute of how to think about these steps. In any circumstance, you can imagine a need to define obligations, to identify the responsibilities, who's responsible for making this happen, and then ident establishing mechanisms, how are we going to make it happen, and then finally and importantly, how are we going to hold to account those who are meant to do things in order to make them happen? And there are some very interesting examples from other industries that just show you how this might be applied to finance. Look at the second row, uh, nuclear and chemical, and think Bhopal, and think for chemical, huge explosion in India, self-regulatory mechanisms not imposed by government but by the industry itself to prevent accidents of that kind happening. It's just not acceptable to run a chemical plant in the way that it used to be acceptable. Similarly, it's not acceptable to, do, I was going to say to do Chernobyl, that's certainly not acceptable, but what happened in Three Mile Island isn't either. And that's not been uh, ensured by government regulatory behaviour. It's been because there's an understanding you don't do things like that, that might make that possible. <laughs> Back to Facebook and making the dials work. Um, at, right down at the bottom is another very different, interesting example, the diamond exchange in New York. The risk with diamonds is that they're very small and, you know, here's my flash drive. It's big compared with a diamond, very easy to steal. And there, it's impossible looking at one to work out whether it's a blood diamond that has come from civil war in Africa. You've got to have a very clear uh, understanding of the provenance. How's this enforced in New York? Uh, it's enforced by that market being run by a particular component of the Jewish community. And that community will essentially ostracize anyone who behaves badly, not just from the market, but for the entirety of their social life. Sanctioned very strong. It's like shooting someone uh, in, on sentry duty. This table shows that there's a range of interesting some different but supportive ways of thinking about doing the things that I've been describing.
That brings me to the end of my story. Those working in the financial sector, we think, need to be more strongly bound by a sense of obligation for what they're doing. Uh, and the governance of the firms of, in which those firms work needs to be made to bring to bear pressure on people working in firms to behave this way. And it's a particular pleasure to me uh, to talk to uh, a, a group of Islamic people and Islamic scholars interested in bringing an ethical tradition different from my own to thinking about this important and challenging ethical social issue. Thank you very much.